morning. My three panelists really exemplify disruptive innovation from redefining venture capital to driving single market economies or building one of the fastest growing companies in the world. They're extraordinary women and this is going to be a spirited discussion. I'd like to welcome Mayel, Marie and Joe to the panel. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> So, Joe, two years ago, when I was in London for this conference, I was stuck in a demonstration of black cabs, protesting against Uber. That continues. There's not a day that goes by that your company is not in the paper, whether it's from taking a significant controversial investment in the last two weeks to having two of your executives fined for corrupt practices in France. Tell me, what are the challenges that you're facing leading and managing such an exciting but highly disruptive business? <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a big question. Uh, I guess um, one of the reasons why um, everyone at, at Uber is so passionate about working here is that there are a few things that we believe in and that we're fighting for in cities. So giving people on the consumer side the, the right to press a button and get a car, and, and on the driver side, essentially to get work at the, the touch of a button. Um, people use the word disruptive quite often, um, and I guess one of the challenging things is that we are often, in many instances, disrupting an industry that hasn't seen much competition in, in decades, um, and that always causes, causes concern for the incumbents. Overall, we think that competition's good. Um, it makes the services rise for the consumer, but also brings more opportunities on the driver side. Uh, but here in the UK, for example, we've seen huge protests as, such as uh, the ones you mentioned. I mean, interestingly, that first protest in 2014, uh, no one had actually heard of Uber, really, before that. Yeah. Um, and the black cabs were very keen to make out that it wasn't about Uber. And everyone said, oh, that's interesting, what's Uber? I, I hadn't heard of it. Uh, but, but obviously, it, it has been very, very challenging, challenging times for us. Uh, I guess what we're always trying to do, as well as growing the business at breakneck speed, is also making sure that we're really telling our story. And I think that's something we've not always done as well as we could. And explaining the benefits that Uber can bring to cities uh, and trying to prevent some of the myths that are out there from spreading further. So, Mayal, you've encountered, I'm sure, some of these issues. You built, you know, Ozon very successfully, but in a very challenging market. Um, you're now a very senior executive at Priceline. You're in the center of conversations about the single digital market. So how are you pioneering disruptive innovation, arguably in a business that is 10 to 15 years old? So I think when we talk about disruptive innovation in, in both my companies, so Ozone, uh, which was and still is the largest e-commerce group in Russia, and the Priceline Group, uh, which is the largest travel company in the world, travel group in the world with brands like Booking.com, Priceline.com, but also Kayak or OpenTable, all these brands uh, belong to us. What we're trying to what we're trying to focus on is is three things: is uh, customers, people, and culture. And what we're saying is, um, you start with your customer. The way you innovate is by figuring out what your customers really want. So at Ozone, uh, we discovered that it was all about cash on delivery. They didn't want to use credit cards, so we built up an entire delivery system built around cash on delivery. Uh, at Priceline, at the Priceline Group, depending on our companies, but if we look at Booking.com, which is our largest company and probably the most known here uh, in Europe, uh, we started by focusing on hotels and how to make it easy for customers to book hotels because 10 years ago that wasn't that easy. Uh, and now what we understand, what we hear from our customers is help us to discover the world. Don't help us just book a hotel. Help us to uh, do activities in the destination. So we've just launched uh, something really new, uh, which is the capability to book in advance uh, different activities, visits to the museums, um, 
when you are in destination. And if we look at Open Table, same thing. We heard our customer telling us, help us discover restaurants. So we yesterday announced that we were launching a new app to help you discover restaurants. So that's about customers. And then really briefly, on people, in both the companies I've worked for or I, I managed, we try to always hire entrepreneurs because at the end of the day, business is always about people. It's great to have processes, but if your people are not entrepreneurs at heart and want to drive their, the business for you, it's going to be really hard. And entrepreneurs are innovative because they want to change the world. So hire entrepreneurs, that usually helps you a lot. And then finally, culture. Uh, again, in both companies, there's more similarity than, than differences. And the biggest similarity is around the fact that failure is accepted, that you need to test your way through a solution. And as you test your way uh, to it, you're probably going to fail a thousand times to succeed once. And that's fine. That's how you disrupt the world. So that's what we've done in all our businesses. So Marie, you're taking disruption into venture capital, which is an interesting time to do this at a sort of an evolving economic time um, and with a lot of regulatory discussion. What is your approach? Come on, give me, I'm in, I'm in the same business. So, you know, <laughs> what, what are you doing that's going to be so compelling? So we actually started from that customer-centric point that for us is really, a, there's two key elements that are, um, that are plugged into digital economy. One is you have to be customer centric. The other one is that it's now an international competition. So plugging these two together, one we thought we were having a very poor value proposition for our customers and we have two types of customers. We have our investors, people putting money in the fund, but we also have entrepreneurs because the good entrepreneurs choose their investors and these are the ones you actually want. So if you're uh, having very little value proposition either to investors because all you're doing is putting, getting money from the top and then pushing it downwards, then it's easy to be disintermediated and just have plat uh, crowdfunding platform and all this who will kind of distribute the money. So question is, what is that value proposition you're having? And for investors on a classic VC fund, what you actually have is they put money at uh, year one and you give them a return year 12, basically. So it's a 12-year period where you're not providing a lot of value to your customers, which is not, from my perspective, a very good customer relationship. So I thought, what, and knowing that the world is super, it's changing very rapidly, and that we're really, um, are the ones who are closest to what is happening in terms of innovation, the way economy is changing, um, the different business models, and that all these people are, are interested in understanding the world, in understanding the new usage. Knowledge is something that we can bring as value number one. Value number two would be you can have the direct connection to the innovation world. Uh, so that was the way we thought about it. And for entrepreneurs, we have something very special in Europe is that there's no way we can build a great and big company without going internationally very fast. You can do that in the US, reach critical mass on your single market. You cannot do that in Europe. So value number one that we thought we could provide to entrepreneurs is how to help them grow their business internationally. And by doing that and understanding the digital culture with that, so it's today venture capital is a craftsmanship. You have a very small team that build a great reputation and track record and that the question is who you're gonna have at your board. And we thought we should build a brand and give access to all our network directly. So we're built this community of 150 people, which is internationally dispersed, and we plug everybody on the platform. Uh, so we, they can have access to our deal flow. They can have access and participate to deal sourcing, but also to due diligences. And then they can help the companies because all the founders are plugged on the platform. So we just kind of gave access directly and reduced the cycle from investors and our network, quality network, to founders. So this is interesting because for the investors, they get knowledge because we also, since we're building a community, it means you have to build engagement, you have to build knowledge, you have to give that. So in our teams, we have community builders, which their work is to build content, to give insights on what's going on, to make the connections and have different events so they really are engaged. But they, everybody just have access to the platform, know every deal we're looking at, they can tell us what they think, they can co-invest with us, et cetera, et cetera. So let's talk about sort of the entrepreneur environment and also the role that regulation plays because I'm very struck. You're all in some way, shape or form in businesses that get exposed to regulation. 
yet you're all great examples of individuals who are entrepreneurial and supportive of entrepreneurs. Joe, starting with you, regulation, you know, good, bad, how is it affecting you? Well, contrary to, to popular belief, Uber actually wants to be regulated. I, I think some of our challenges um, are, however, that um, in many of the countries we operate, like in the UK, that regulation was written way before the advent of smartphones or Google Maps. Here in London, the latest regulation was written in 1998. And therefore, regulators are faced with this really difficult challenge of how do you interpret that regulation in the light of, of modern technology. Uh, and then when we think about regulation moving forward, one of the things we're always trying to encourage is that we don't fall into that same trap again, and that we make sure that um, regulation is focused on achieving the right outcome, whether that's consumer protection or, or safety in the best possible way, but in a technology neutral way. So we shouldn't have regulation, for example, that mandates a printer in cars, because even now that's, that's already a bit old fashioned. But even as we think of new technology, how do we make sure that the regulation isn't out of date um, as soon as it's written? Mael, how are you seeing that, you know, with re respect to where it's the single digital market, but also, you know, the European Commission has been actually quite supportive of sites in some respects, like Uber and like Airbnb. I think this question of the single digital market is probably the biggest question for uh, tech startups here in Europe. And I think this is one of the biggest disadvantages that Europe has versus the US. And one of the reasons, and in my view, one of the biggest reasons why uh, European startups are not usually as successful as American ones. Obviously, there are exceptions, and Booking.com is one of them. We're probably one of the very few super hyper successful uh, European company. We were born in Amsterdam, so we're, we're very, very European. Um, but I think uh, it is extremely hard if you want to reach critical size in Europe to uh, actually make it happen because the legislation is different. Sometimes you just move 200 miles and that's it. You have a different uh, tax legislation, different labor uh, laws. It's completely different and I think the European Union has been indeed pushing uh, more and more to unify the market. But what we see, uh, for example, when we talk about pricing parity, which is a, a big thing right now in the travel industry, um, we see that there is a directive at the European level, uh, which was very clear for everybody, but now pretty much every single European country is adapting it to their local, uh, local environment. And though I do understand uh, because my country is at the forefront of the customization of legislation. Uh, though I do understand why countries want to do that um, because they want to keep ownership, I think this is a massive issue for businesses because only big businesses like us have the manpower and the financial uh, means to actually make it happen. If you're a small startup with five people, this is very unlikely that you're going to be able right. to adapt to 15 different legislation. Let's quickly turn to the audience. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, just going back to sort of disruption, all three of you have had to take stands in different ways, whether it's, you know, Joe, you know, everything that you're dealing with on a daily basis. I mean, you've been hounded on Twitter. As I sort of Googled you, I, you know, I just actually don't understand how anyone can keep their sanity. You have really taken a beating in social media. Marie, Mael, you know, your leaders in very big disruptive businesses as well. How have you managed to deal with this when as leaders, all three of you have had your share of criticism. I think the important thing is what you do and knowing that in general, um, like for example, I, I had this um, woman before who was telling me she's fundraising a new fund, she's very young, and she was like, well, how the 10 first minute of the meeting when it's all man, for example, is super hard because you have to prove why you're here. I'm mean, like, this is like the wrong answer. Because knowing if you think that you have to prove why you're here, you just lost the battle. And you're a lot more efficient if what you're trying to do and the purpose of what you're doing is what you're good at. And this is what you should translate. So it's obvious that, so don't spend time on this would be my answer. Right. It's not important. Completely agree. Well said. Joe? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I would agree. Um, it's, it's obviously tough, but, but trying to um, depersonalize it. If you're going to make changes, um, there's always going to be someone who, who doesn't like that, that change. Um, having said that, um, even if you can rationalize it in your head, it's not always so easy to rationalize it inside. So I actually don't use my Twitter account, and one of my colleagues uh, looks at it, and it's much easier not, not to see that. Um, we obviously try to um, make sure our team is not exposed to that as, as far as we can. And then, unfortunately, it is probably just a small, um, a small group who are not representative of um, the, the group at large or the industry at large. And it's just important to remember that, it, that it's not actually personal. Benefit of hindsight, would you have dealt with the cabbies um, a little differently? We actually tried at the time of that um, 20, 2014 strike, we actually did try to extend an olive branch by actually suggesting that uh, opening up the app for taxis to use um, the Uber platform to get a few extra, extra jobs. Um, and we've very much been trying to position that we want to actually level the playing field ourselves. We think we should do that by lowering the barriers for black taxis, however, not by increasing them for, for everyone else. It, it sounds like we probably could have done a better job at getting that out there sometimes, but, but but overall, I think our intention was right. Marie, as you, you build your business, if you can think just very quickly, because um, I'd like to hear from each of you, one piece of advancement or legislation that you would, or initiative that you would like to see occur in the next two years that would really spur significant innovation and entrepreneurship? Wow. So that's a very tough one um, because I think you need to rebuild everything from scratch. And that the main, <laughs> but the if main you could do one being, thing, just given that we don't have too much time. Yeah. Okay. So the, my understanding is that the digital economy is providing a new way of, uh, just from an economical perspective. You used to be in a system where the idea would be you go to work so you have the biggest wage possible and so that you can spend more. Like every economical model is around this. You optimize your utility, so you earn a lot of money, then you get to spend it, and that's the aim. Now it's very different. The equation is I need to, so I work, so I get money from that, but I can also optimize my cost by either renting my house or um, sharing my car or doing a lot of different things. And that completely makes the way you think about legislation change. So I think it's not a question of adding one legislation or another. It's a question of taking a blank sheet, of understanding exactly what are the new consequences of this economy, which is not an economy, it's changing our society. So it has different social models, it has all this. And the reason why Estonia is so much in advance in Europe on all this is because they had to rewrite everything right. in 91. Right. So it's brand new. So this is the way we should think of it, and we should think of it, in, as you were saying, in a very adaptive way, knowing that it's not because we're going to rewrite everything now, that in two years' time, because it's changing so quickly, we shouldn't be Constant able to Constant iteration. Exactly. Maya, any thoughts? I, I tend to agree completely. I think legislation is about clarity rather than complexity, uh, and we need more clarity. Uh, and it's probably going to be hard if we don't do it from a blank sheet uh, stage. Um, if I can just name one, pricing parity obviously for us and booking.com would be massively important so that there is clarity around that. But outside of our business, I think there's a need to um, unify the tax system. Like, just like the VAT, try to pay VAT in Europe if you're a multi-country business, it's just a nightmare. You have to have a department to take care of that. Uh, or the labor law, same thing, because they're so different from one country to another that, again, you need a full department. Uh, and it's not good for startups. You're right. Well, you three are all incredible innovators. Um, Mael, Marie, Joe, thank you for joining us. Sure. Thank, thank you. you.